Good morning, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. My name is Jerry McLaughlin. I'm from San Mateo, California. First, I just want to thank you for all the effort you put into the annual reports, the letters, and, and these conversations. I've learned a lot, and they're, they're terrific, which is why I'm here from half a country away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You know, you've said that great companies are those that have an economic moat. And I understand that phrase to mean a sustainable competitive advantage. Do businesses begin their lives with sustainable competitive advantages, or must that be developed over a very long time? And then, what are the fundamental bases upon which you've seen companies successfully develop sustainable competitive advantages. Of those, which do you think is the most enduring and which is the least? Well, sometimes they can develop it very quickly. I mean, I would say that Microsoft, in terms of the operating system, you know, that was a relatively uh, quick development. But that was an industry that was exploding and things were changing very fast. On the other hand, if you go back to Seize Candy, which started in 1921, you know, there is no way you could build a uh, sustainable competitive advantage, at least that would be recognizable in times measured shorter than decades. I mean, you opened up one shop at a time and nobody had heard of you originally, and then a few people did. And box chocolates were something that, that you know, people may have bought once or twice a year for holiday occasions or whatsoever. So you weren't going to embed yourself in the minds of Californians in one or two or five years just because you were turning out you know, an outstanding uh, box of chocolates. So it depends, it depends on the way the industry itself is developing. Uh, you know, Walmart uh, has done a fabulous job, in a, an incredible job, in a, quite a short period of time. Uh, uh, but even they, you know, they, they took it in the small towns and they, they progressed along and refined their techniques as they went. Uh, but I would say that there could be in, there could be things in new industries. Uh, I would say with with NetJets, we have a sustainable competitive advantage, and that's an industry that was only originated in 1986 you know, when Rich Santulli got the idea, and it was in its inf I mean total infancy for a good many years after that. But uh, what he has built is and is building and, and, and fortifying is that sustainable com competitive advantage. But it, it depends very much on the industry you're in. And I mean, Coca-Cola, 1886, Jacobs Pharmacy, Atlanta, Georgia, you know, John Pemberton came up with a product. Did he have a sustainable competitive advantage that day? If he did, he, he blew it because he sold the place for 2,000 bucks today. He's a gambler. Uh, he did, and it took decades thousands of competitors over that time and you know but they were painting one barn at a time and designing one Saturday evening post ad at a time and all of that and and pebbles you know at, around the world in, in World War II uh, General Eisenhower went to Mr. Woodruff and he said I want an, I want a, I want a coke within the arm's length of every American serviceman he said I want something to remind him of home and so he built a lot of bottling plants for for coke around the world and uh, you know that that was a huge impetus, but that was that was what sixty years or so after the product was invented. Uh, so it 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 takes it takes a long time in in certain kinds of products, but I could see certain areas of the world where uh, a huge competitive advantage was built in a very short period of time. I would say that probably in terms of of animated. Uh, feature-length films, for example. Walt Disney did that and you know, after Snow White and a few more. It took him a while till he could cash in on it, but he, it became Disney and nobody else in that field for quite a while, and fairly quickly. Charlie? Yeah, there are a lot of different models that create a sustainable competitive advantage, and there are also some models of, of, of um, where you can lose it very fast. You just ask Arthur Anderson. That, that, that was a very good name in America not very long ago. Uh, and I think it would be harder to lose the good name of Wrigley's gum 
than the good name of Arthur Anderson. Uh, I think there's some perfectly remarkable competitive advantages that people have gotten over time. And uh, the great trouble with the investment process is that they're so damned obvious that the stocks sell at very high prices. Snickers has been the number one candy bar for probably 30 or 40 years now. now yeah, and what, in Russia, that turns out everybody likes Snickers. Yeah. What? How do you really knock it off? You know, I mean, we make candy. We we would love to displace Snickers, but it's hard to think of ways to knock them from the number one spot. I mean, my guess is that they'll be number one in you know ten years from now in in, in candy bars, and and the list doesn't change much in that field because. Uh, of, if you think about the nature of how you make that choice as to what candy bar. If, if you were chewing spearmint, spearmint chewing gum five years ago and you buy a pack of some chewing gum today, it's likely to be spearmint. I mean, there's just there's things that you experiment a lot with and there are things that you don't fool around with once you're happy. And, and you know, you can understand that if you observe your own habits and people's habits around you. Uh, but there's other... Usually, if something can gain competitive advantage very quickly, uh, you have to worry about them losing it quickly, too. I mean, when an industry is in flux, uh, there are a lot of people that think they're the survivors or the, or the ones that are going to prosper that, that, where it turns out otherwise. I've come to the conclusion that great investors are made, not born. Do you and Mr. Munger agree with this conclusion? If so, why? If not, why not? And if you do agree, what things would you recommend that someone do if they wanted to become a great investor? Also, what mental attributes do you think a person should have if they want to try to become a great investor? Thank you very much. Yeah, I largely agree with what you said. It, it, uh, I would say that there, I don't know to what extent uh, an ability to detach yourself from the crowd, for example. I don't know to what extent that's innate or to what extent that's learned, but that's a quality you need. I, w I would agree totally with you that a, a, great, a great IQ is not needed. I mean, you do not have to be terrifically smart to do well as an investor at all. Uh, I would say you're 100% right that I learned from Graham first in a very, very big way, and I learned something additionally from Phil Fisher, and I learned a lot from, from Charlie. And the proof is in my record, actually. From 11 to 19, I was reading Garfield Drew and Edwards and McGee and all kinds of, I mean, I read every book, Gerald M. Loeb. I mean, I read every book there was on investments, and I didn't do well at all. And I had no real investment philosophy. I had a lot of things I tried. I was having a lot of fun. I wasn't making any money. And I read Ben's book in 1940. Nine or 50, 49, when I was at the University of Nebraska, and, and that actually just changed my whole view of investing. It, and really, it basically told me to think about a stock as a part of a business. Now, that seems so obvious. You can say, you know, that, that why should you regard that as, a, as, as, as the Rosetta Stone? But it is the Rosetta Stone in a sense. It, it, uh, once you crank into your mental apparatus that you're not looking at things that wiggle up and down on charts or that People send you little missives on, you know, saying buy this because it's going up next week or it's going to split or the dividend's going to get increased or whatever. But instead you're buying a business that you've now set a foundation for going on and thinking rationally about investing. And uh, there's no reason why you need a high IQ to do that. Uh, there's no reason why you have to be born in some way. I, I do think there's certain manners of temperament that may be innate, and they may be learned, they may be intensified by experiences you go on, partially innate, but then reinforced in various ways by your experience as you go through life. But that's enormously important. I mean, you have to be realistic. You have to just define your, your circle of competence accurately. You have to know what you don't know and not get enticed by it. You, you can't, you can't be you have to have an interest in money, I think, or you won't be good at investing. But I think if you're very greedy, it'll be a disaster because it, it, that will overcome rationality. Uh, but I think 
I think the same books I read uh, and really molded what I, how I thought about businesses and investing, I think that they're just as valid now. I mean, I haven't seen anything in the last 25 years, and I read, I, I, I glance through most of the books anyway. I've, I've seen nothing to improve on Graham and Fisher in terms of the basic approach of, of going about investing, which is to, is to think about stocks as businesses and then think about what makes a good business. And really, that's all there is to, to investing and, and, and having a margin of safety, which Ben talks about and so on. It's, it's not a complicated process, but it, it, it definitely requires uh, a discipline. It, requ it requires insulating yourself from popular opinion. You just, you simply cannot, you can't pay any attention to it. It just doesn't mean anything. So you can't, the idea of listening to lots of people tell you things and all, that, it's just a waste of time. And, and, you know, you'd, you'd be better off just sitting and thinking a little bit. I mean, there were, there were no analyst reports on custom frame uh, makers, you know. It just doesn't, uh, and, and they wouldn't have been any good anyway. You just have to, you have to think. But you have to think about them as, in terms of their business characteristics and what they can earn on the on the on capital employed and that sort of thing. Uh, I would just read the, you know, I would I would read the Graham and the Phil Fisher books and 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 then read lots of annual reports. Think about businesses and try and think about which businesses you understand and which you don't understand. And you don't have to understand them all. Just forget about the ones that you don't understand. Charlie. Yeah, at a deeper level of generality. If you have a passionate interest in in knowing why things are happening, you always are trying to figure out the world in terms of why is this happening or why is this not happening. Uh, that cast of mind kept over long periods uh, gradually improves your ability to, to cope with reality. Uh, and if you don't have that cast of mind, I think you're uh, you're destined probably for failure, even if you've got a pretty high IQ. Yeah, I would say we've seen relatively little correlation between investment results and IQ. I mean, that, not, not that there are a whole bunch of people out there with 80 IQs that are knocking you know the cover off the ball, but but there are all kinds of people with high IQs. That get no place, and you have to, it's, it's probably in a sense it's more interesting to look at why people with high IQs don't succeed, and then sort of cast out those factors and see if you can cast them out in yourself, uh, and leave a residual that will work. Because if you you know it's like Charlie always says you know all I want to know is where I'm going to die so I'll never go there. So you know, if you study the people who die financially. You know, with high IQs, and say, why do they die? You know, uh, you'll see certain overwhelming characteristics that are present in 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 in, in, these, in most of the cases, and you just got to make sure that either you don't possess them, or if you do possess them, that you can get rid of them or control them in some manner.